Let's pray together. Father, we do give you thanks and praise that we can gather together on this day. Thank you for the hope that you've given us in the gospel of your Son, and we pray that as we attend to your word today, please, Father, give us ears to hear. Open our hearts to receive the truth that sets us free, and give us eyes to see the glory of your Son and the will and the desire to trust and obey him. Bless us, we pray, in Jesus' name, amen. Well, our text today is from John chapter 8. We'll be focusing in verses 48 to 59 on page 1139 in your pew Bibles, and the sermon notes are in your bulletin if you wish to follow along there. Well, once again, happy Mother's Day, and as these are times I reflect upon the women in my life, and uh, I've been truly blessed by not just one mother, but uh, uh, many mothers in my life. Uh, who have been truly faithful, and uh, my mom, of course, but then her two sisters who came and, and practically raised us as their own kids as well. My three sisters, I'll add to that my wife, and her mother too as well. And they have this in common. They are all Christian women, godly women, um, faithful, submissive even, respectful, honoring, traditional, yet by no means doormats. They're not weak and easily bullied. Um, in fact, they can be very feisty. I've noticed this. Um, they have never been intimidated by the experts and the authorities. Uh, I've seen them stand up to doctors and especially to pastors. Um, we have no tolerance for bad pastors. And I have seen the most revered, the austere, and the robed reverends cower in fear at the approach of one of my aunts to talk to him about some of his questionable doctrine in his last sermon. And I must say that being at this church here, that God has been pleased to add many more um, faithful and feisty women uh, in my life, and I'm thankful for the moms of Marcus Street Baptist Church as well. And they have helped me to realize, uh, as something in about a woman, especially a mother, I think, has helped me to realize that, you know, I'm, I am, I'm a man of peace. I'm really a nice guy. I, I know I might appear, appear. I'm really a nice guy, and I don't want, I hate conflict and confrontation, but it has been the women, uh, not the men in my life, who have taught me that there is a time to fight. There is a time to confront, to stand firm, that there are some things in this life that are worth even dying for. And that's what today's passage is about in John chapter 8. As we read it here today, you may have noticed this, this is a fight that is happening here, that Jesus is having with the Jewish authorities. It is an all-out fight. It even ends, if you noticed, with them picking up stones and ready to kill him. And I want to go through that passage again. In John chapter 8, in verse 31 on page 1138, it begins just normally as Jesus often does. He, he speaks to the Jews who believed in him, and he tells them this very simple phrase, verse 31, look, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Now, that sounds great. What could possibly be wrong with that? And yet, they take offense at this. In verse 33, they take offense. Look, we are, how, how dare you insinuate that we need to be set free? What are you talking about? The truth will set you free. We are children of Abraham. Don't you see that? We have been enslaved to no one. We have, you know, God set us free back in the days of Moses. He freed us when we were slaves. And we are a free people. And even though, yes, the Romans rule the world right now, but we are a free people. Don't you see that? How dare you say that we are slaves that need to be freed? And Jesus responds in verse 34, which we've discussed before. Rome is not your problem. Egypt's not your problem. Your problem is sin, that you practice sin. You're slaves to sin. And because you're slaves to sin, you will not dwell in this house forever. They're in the temple right now. The sun will dwell forever in this house. And so the Son must set you free. 
And he says, look, I know your offspring of Abraham. I know your children of Abraham. And yet, you want to kill me, don't you? You want to kill me. Because my word has no place in you. You hate my word. And I speak of what my, my father and you, you do what your father's has done, and you've heard from him. They respond in verse 39. Look, Abraham's our father, Jesus. And he says, look, if you were really Abraham's children, if you were really your father, you would be doing the things that he did. And one of the things that he would never do is kill me. Abraham would not kill the man who brings him the word of God. He says, in fact, I'll tell you who your real father is. Your real father is the devil himself. He was a murderer and a liar from the beginning. That's what we had left off last time. And they continue in this passage today. The battle continues. Now they respond to that accusation. Our father is the devil? No, your father is the devil. Are we not right in saying, verse 48... That you are a Samaritan and you are, have a demon. And just, I don't have a demon. But I honor my father and you dishonor me. And then it continues from there. He goes further and calls them liars. He says, I know God, you don't know God. If I said I didn't know God, I would be a liar like you. They don't take that very well. And he goes and claims this, this last phrase in verse 58. Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. And at that point, it's just too much. Fine, it's time to kill this man. And they pick up stones, and he escapes from their grasp. It is a fight that is happening. You can see how it escalates. This this is one of my all-time favorite chapters in the Gospels because it is filled with this drama and this tension, and it's rising to the point of murder at this point. So what is this fight all about? John, I believe, presents this to us to lay out, this is what the battle is about. These are some things worth fighting, standing for, worth dying for. These are the battles that will tear apart a nation. These are the battles that will end in the death of the Son of God as well. And what is the battle about? Well, I want to turn your attention to the question that is being asked in verse 53. Verse 53, I think, is the question that this battle is about. They ask Jesus, who do you make yourself out to be? In other words, who do you think you are? That's what this is about. It's about the identity. This is the most important question. The whole point of the Gospel of John is to answer that question, who is this Jesus? Who does he think he is? first and then what should we think about that so we want to ask that question who does jesus actually think he is and he gives i believe in this text verses 48 to 59 three clear answers as to who he thinks he is and who he claims to be first it should not surprise you you could probably fill it in without even without a thought here that he thinks he is in fact the son of god He's often referred to himself as he comes through. He talks about himself as the son, the son of man. And he talks about his father who sent him. But he's not often clear about, well, who's his father? And the Jews are oftentimes confused. Who is is your father? We know you're the son of Joseph. So is that who he's talking about? That he's saying his father Joseph is the one he's referring to? Or maybe, and this is what they're thinking, Maybe there's some other guy who is your father, if you know what I mean. Because we know Joseph wasn't exactly your father, was he? We know he raised you. But unlike you, Jesus, we were not born of sexual immorality. So who is this father? And in this passage, he makes it very clear who his father is. In verse 54, he answers them. If I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It is my Father who glorifies me, of whom you say he is our God. It makes it very clear 
And when he talks about his father, he is talking about God, the God whom these Jews say, this is our God, the one true God, the God most high. And he makes it very clear to them in that verse, I am, in fact, the son of God. And he describes his relationship to God the Father that is unlike anything we have seen before. You can study all the people of the Bible, you will not see anything near the relationship that Jesus has to God as the Son of God. He describes it this way. Listen to the things he says. Verse 49, he says to them regarding his relationship to the Father, he says, I do not have a demon, but I honor my Father and you dishonor me. In verse 50, he says, I do not seek my own glory. There is one, that's the Father, he seeks it and he's the judge. Down to verse 54, if I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It's my Father who glorifies me, of whom you say he is our God. And in verse 55, you, God, my Father, you have not known him, I know him. If I were to say that I do not know him, I would be a liar like you, but I do know him and I keep his word. Jesus presents himself not just as a son of God, but the Son of God, the true and the perfect Son of God, who at all times and all places always honors and obeys his Father. He says this again and again. I do not glorify myself. I seek the glory of my Father. I honor him. That's why I'm here, to honor him, to do his will. And then he says, and he obeys his Father. I keep his word, he says. I didn't come to do my will. He says, I came to do the will of him who sent me. Jesus comes perfectly obedient to his Father, to God, and always honoring his Father with perfection. You do not see that in anyone in the Old Testament. Every character, even the greatest of them, Moses and David and Elijah and the great, greatest of the prophets and the patriarchs, they are all deeply flawed. When you read the Old Testament, you're like, whoa. These guys? Really? This is your people? You're shocked. But with Christ, you see the perfection laid out. He's the true Son of God. He honors and obeys his Father always. And for this, therefore, Jesus is eternally loved and glorified by his Father. Remember that foundational truth that's mentioned a few times in the Gospel of John. The eternal truth. The Father loves the Son. He loves him. And when Jesus says, I know him, I know him, what he's saying there is, I have experienced the fullness of God's love for me. That's what it is to know, to be loved, to know that you are loved, to experience that love. I know God. That's why the prayer that Paul always prays for the church is, I'm praying that you will know and grasp the depth of God's love for you in Christ. Christ knows he is loved by his Father. And that's all that God seems to say when he speaks from the clouds. In the Gospels, what does he say almost every time? This is my Son, whom I love, with whom I am well pleased. He's the love of the Father and glorified by his Father. It is the Father who honors him. The Son honors the Father, the Father honors honors the Son, glorifies Him in all that He does, places Him in the high, highest place of all. So that's the first part, the Son of God. But now there's this question. To say that Jesus is the Son of God is a powerful statement, but it is not fully clear what is meant by that. And there's been controversy throughout church history, especially in the early centuries, and then later on, with some of, the, some of the cults that have developed about who is this Jesus as the Son of God. Fine, we believe that he's the Son of God, but what does that mean? Well, there was a man named Arius who was a leader in the church in the early centuries. And he basically believed that Jesus, yes, he's the Son of God. But he's not eternal, and he was created by God. He's the first and the best of all his creatures. And he made the world through, and Jesus then created everything else, but he is not eternal. That there was a time when the Son was not. There was just the Father, or there was just God. And so God sort of became a Father at some point. 
and he's the first creature. So yes, he's glorious, but he is not God himself. And so that's the question we say, is that what Jesus means? Is he a God like the sons of God in the days of Noah? These spiritual authorities, these glorious creatures who are still creatures. Is he of a different type? Well, who does Jesus think he is? Well, as our text unfolds, they speak. He speaks about Abraham. And he says this in verse 56. Your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and was glad. And they said, you're not 50 years old. And you've seen Abraham? He said, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. There's so much in that. He declares himself in this few verses here. I am not just the son of God. I am the God of Abraham. Abraham rejoiced to see my day. Now that's significant because Abraham is the father of faith. And there is no one like him in the Old Testament who was so singularly devoted to the most high God. He has flaws. He's got issues. But he only worships the Lord, only rejoices in God. And for Jesus to say that he rejoiced in my day, to see my day, is equating himself with God himself, the God most high, for one thing. And if that's not clear enough to say, before Abraham even was, I am, which you heard in today's passage in Exodus 3, that is the name of God. When God says to Moses, go, and he says, whom shall I say is sending me? And you tell them, I am. I sent you, that's my name. And so Jesus proclaims himself here. He thinks himself to be the God of Abraham. Jesus thinks that he was the one who called Abraham out of the land of Ur and called him into the land of Canaan. Jesus thinks of himself as the one who came and visited with Abraham and told him that he would have a son. And Abraham worshipped him. He thinks himself to be the God of Abraham in our passage. And he is the one, as the God of Abraham, who fulfills all the promises given to Abraham. Abraham's whole life is based upon promises. Genesis 12. Come into the land. I'm going to give you this land. There's your promise. I'm going to make a great nation of you. The second promise. And I will bless you. Third promise. And with that third promise is the ultimate promise, which is, and through you, all nations will be blessed. Jesus fulfills all those promises. He is the one who will also bless all the nations, the one that Abraham was looking for to come and will break the curse and bring God's blessing to all the nations. This is a big theme in John's gospel, by the way, that Jesus is not simply the savior of the Jews, that he's the Messiah for the Jews, but he's the savior of the whole world, even when he describes him as the Lamb of God. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away, what? The sins of the world. It was the Passover lamb just took away the sins of the Jews or the Israelites. And God so loved the world, John 3.16, of course you know. As a side note, it's really interesting. I want to point something out to you that's very interesting. In verse 48, they insult him by saying, are we not right in saying that you are a Samaritan, the most despised of people to us, and that you have a demon? And Jesus defends himself, and what's fascinating is how he defends himself. He says, I do not have a demon. But he doesn't say, I am not a Samaritan. He does not disown the Samaritan people as despised as they are. That's the beauty of it. Christ is the Savior. He belongs to all the nations. We can say that Jesus is a Jew, and we can say Jesus is a Samaritan, and Jesus is a Gentile, and Jesus is an American. He belongs to all the nations. He is not ashamed to call any who come to him as his brothers by faith. He does not disown the Samaritans. He is indeed the one who brings the blessing to all the nations, even the most despised of them. 
Well, finally, who else does he think he is? So he thinks he is the son of God. He believes himself to be the God of Abraham. And then third, he believes himself to be the Lord of Moses. Again, look at that last verse. Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. And that phrase, I am, appears a lot in the book of John. Seven times he will say that of himself, I am the light of the world. I am the bread of life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the resurrection, again and again and again. He presents himself as the Lord of Moses, who is the eternal I am. That phrase that God describes himself as I am is, it's, it's a dizzying phrase. Because when I ponder it, I am. That God just is. There was never a time when he was not. You can't think of alternate realities. God is the reality. He just is. And you're like, where does he come from? He just is. He always is. He's eternally so. And, and you start going back in space and time in your mind, and it takes you, it's like, wow, I am. That simple phrase, I am, he is, he was, he always will be. There's never a time when he was not. But as the great I am, he is not some cold and impersonal force of nature. If you read the section on Moses, in fact, would you turn there with me? Because I want you to see this in Exodus chapter 3. I believe that's on page 59. When, when God appears to Moses and calls himself the great, the I am, which is an awesome title, and yet there's something else about the Lord of Moses in that passage in Exodus 3. He says this in verse 7. First he says, Moses sees a bush that's burning, but it's not being consumed. And God says, take off your sandals, you're on holy ground. And then in verse 6 he declares himself, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land to a good and broad land. He is the Lord of Moses. He is the glorious, holy, eternal I am. But he, as the Lord of Moses, is the one who hears the cries of his people. He's seen the affliction of them. He hears their cries. He knows their sufferings. Indeed, Jesus is exactly that way. He is that Lord. The one speaking to Moses is the Son of God. It is the God of Abraham. This is Christ before he takes human flesh. And he's the one who sees, who knows, who hears the cries. He knows their sufferings why Christ is referred to as a sympathetic high priest because he's tempted in every way like us he knows our sufferings and yet without sin and he comes to deliver them from their enemies to bring judgment on his enemies the oppressors and to bring them out of the land of slavery through great acts of judgment against them the great I am will deliver them from the power of Pharaoh and when the Lord takes that and says, I am, he's taking that place. I'm the Lord of Moses. And just as Mo the Lord of Moses delivered the Israelites out of the land of slavery in Egypt and brought them into the promised land, so I, the Lord of Moses, now I'm coming to deliver all the nations from the power of sin and death, from your slavery to sin and death and suffering. He has heard our cries of affliction. Because this world is just filled with suffering and pain and affliction in our lives as well. And sin torments us and he has heard our cries and he has come, he says, not to condemn the world, but to save the world. To deliver us, to set the captives free. And again, just as the Lord of Israel provided the Passover lamb who would be sacrificed for the sins of his people and take their place, so the Lord himself becomes the Passover lamb the Lamb of God for the sins of the world. And that, by the way, is the meaning of the burning bush. You see this bush that's on fire 
terrifying and awesome sight, but it's a strange sight because the bush is not being consumed. This bush that should be kindling, it should go up like that, like a Christmas tree, like just should be gone, but it's not being consumed by this fire. What is the meaning of that? Well, the meaning is this, that God, the Lord of Moses, is a holy fire, consuming everything, but he does not consume those who take refuge in him. Those who are in him, he does not consume. Even the driest and the weakest of us, he does not consume. As it says, the bruised reed he will not break, and he will not quench the smoking flax. He is so tender with us who take refuge in him. Blessed are those who take refuge in him. He will destroy. He will tear down kingdoms and kings. He will cast the dragon into the eternal fires. There is no one that can stop him. And yet, for all who take refuge in him, even the weakest and most pathetic of his sheep, he will not consume. But he will lift them up and raise them up on the last day. And that's what he promises If anyone keeps my word, he says in John 8, he will never taste death. So that's what Jesus thinks he is. Let's review that. He thinks thinks he's the son of God. He thinks that he is the God of Abraham and the Lord of Moses. He thinks that he is the one who has come to set us free from sin and death and to give to us eternal life. He believes that. He thinks that. He declares that. And John, when he presents it this way, it is so clear. We have to choose because the question now is, who do you think he is? Who do you think he is? Given what Jesus says of himself and declares, we are left with really one of only two acceptable conclusions. Either Jesus is not who he thinks he is, that he's wrong, that he's not the son of God, that he's not the God of Abraham, he's not the Lord of Moses, and in which case the Pharisees, the Jewish leaders, would be correct that he would be a demon-possessed heretic. That's what he would be. They would be absolutely right in that assessment if what he's saying is not true. If it's not true, he cannot be the Christ, he can't be a prophet, and he certainly, he can't even be a good teacher. He cannot be acceptable to us. If what he's saying is not true, Jesus, the son of Nazareth, would be a psychopath. He'd be a demon-possessed heretic who would deceive and destroy any who would dare follow him. He would be like Jim Jones, if you remember him, whose followers, as you know, drank the Kool-Aid and perished because they believed him to be their Lord their leader. And maybe he's intentionally doing these things and he's sinister in himself or maybe he's just crazy and possessed by a demon but this is pure evil and he must be despised and thoroughly rejected. If what he is saying is not true, if he's anything less than the God of Abraham, the Lord of Moses, the Son of God, if he's anything less than that, then he is to be despised and rejected. Even if he is the angel Michael, who uh, some of the the Mormon Jehovah's Witness believe that he is. He is to be thoroughly rejected because he's in rebellion against the Most High God to declare these things of himself. That's what Satan was, was he not? And we are to renounce him if that is the case. If on the other hand, however, what he says is true, then Jesus really is the Christ, the Son of God which is what John is trying to prove to us. He says, that's why I'm writing you this gospel. Don't you know, John 20, 31, I'm writing these things to you so that you will believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. By believing, you may have life in his name. That's the whole point of this. That's the whole point of this story in chapter 8 is to convince you, but really these are the only two alternatives. You cannot go with this idea that Jesus is a a good man, a social reformer, a good teacher, even a prophet, but he's not the son of God, the Lord of Abraham and Moses. He's something less than God himself. That's not an option for us. 
He is a lunatic. He's a demon-possessed heretic. He is someone to be despised and rejected. But if he is the Christ, the Son of God, then Jesus is the one who speaks the truth to us and the truth that sets us free. And he is the Son of God who loves us and has given his life for us because that's what he came to do. And therefore, as such, if, if that is true, then he is the one whom we must what? You know it's there. Trust and obey. That means his promises are to be believed and embraced and lived by, and his commands are to be followed and kept, including the ones in chapter 8, verse 12. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Follow him. You will find the light of life. If you abide in my word, verse 31, you are truly my disciples. You will know the truth. The truth will set you free. Abide in his word. Live by this. Don't just read the scriptures and the gospels. Put into practice. Abide by these things. And truly, truly, verse 51, I say to you, anyone who keeps my word, he will never see death. This is the way to eternal life. The word of Christ. Believe it. Obey it. Practice these things. No matter how long you've been a Christian, keep practicing, keep abiding, keep believing. And heeding also his warnings to those who reject him. In verse 24 of chapter 8, he says to the Jewish leaders, I told you that you would die in your sins. Unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. There's much at stake here. That's why the apostles went to their deaths for these truths over this question of who is this Jesus. They died. They suffered. They were martyred and tortured because of this singular doctrine of who is this Jesus? Who does he think he is? Well, I mentioned at the beginning, I have several mothers in my life who are faithful and feisty, and I think there is another mother that I did not mention behind them all, and that is my grandmother, uh, my mother's mother, my Oma. And I think they got her feisty faith from her. My dad wrote that her motto from the time that she was a little girl was, alles oder nichts. That's German, which means all or nothing. And when she committed to something, she was all in. And if she couldn't be all in, she wouldn't, she wouldn't jump in. All or nothing, that was her thing, all or nothing. And it's especially true when it came to her faith. And she was willing to leave her family and to go to just a miserable place on the mission field with my grandfather for 10 years uh, to suffer and to struggle and did not regret a bit of it. All or nothing, Christ is worth it. All or nothing. I think that motto works well for this gospel too. When it comes to Christ, really, it is all or nothing. If Jesus is not the Son of God, give him nothing. Do not give him a thought. Do not give him attention. Do not come into these churches that proclaim his name. Don't honor him. Don't even give him a nod. He is an evil fraud if it's not true. Stay away. But if Jesus is who he thinks he is and proclaims himself to be, then we really owe him everything, don't we? Our time, our attention, our devotion, all or nothing. So who does Jesus think he is? He thinks he's the son of God. He thinks he's the God of Abraham who fulfills all God's promises and blesses the nations. He thinks he's the Lord of Moses who hears the cries of his people and sets them free from sin and death. The question now is, who do you think he is? Let's pray. Father, we pray even today that you would help us in our faith. We do believe, but help our unbelief. And we pray that you would give to each of us grace to see who Jesus really is as your son and what this means and how this changes everything, all our lives in every facet. Give us grace to believe and to obey. 
Please, Father, by your Holy Spirit, draw us to your Son, in whom alone is life eternal. We pray this in his name. Amen.